Today we will look at the breakdown of the Union by considering how failed compromises over the institution of slavery increased sectional tension between the North and the South, and the, and the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1861 ultimately led to civil war. It's on the road to disunion. Previously, we talked about manifest destiny and American expansion in the 19th century. The big question was whether new territories would ultimately allow slavery. This was an issue because Northerners and Southerners wanted to have as many votes as possible in Congress. But to keep the other from, other from having too much power, both sides compromised and tried to maintain a balance between slave states and free states. Remember, each state gets two votes um, in the Senate regardless of size. What we'll see in the 1850s is growing tension between North and South that will ultimately lead to civil war. The first such compromise actually took place in 1820 when Missouri applied to join the Union as a slave state. At the time, there were 20 states, 10 free and 10 slave. Again, that perfect balance that politicians were seeking. Northerners in Congress delayed Missouri's admission until they could find a state to counter to maintain the balance. Ultimately, as part of the Missouri Compromise, Missouri would enter the Union as a slave state, Maine would enter as a free state, but more importantly, the Compromise drew the 3630 line, which said any future states from the Louisiana Territory north of this line would enter as free states, and any states south of the line would enter as slave states. Remember, most of the territory west of the Louisiana Territory was possessed by Spain in 1820. Ultimately, this agreement did work and helped maintain sectional harmony until the 1850s. In 1850, California applied to join the United States as a free state. California's population dramatically increased after the Mexican War when the United States bought the territory from Mexico. Also during this time, gold was discovered, leading to the California Gold Rush in 1849. These people who rushed into California were known as 49ers. So if you're wondering how the, the San Francisco 49ers got their name, this is how. Southerners argued that a majority of California was south of the 30, 3630 line if it were drawn across the continent. And some Southerners started calling for secession, viewing uh, the potential of a California as a free state as a threat to their way of life. Ultimately, the big names in Congress, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John C. Calhoun, got together one last time and constructed a compromise. This compromise, known as the Compromise of 1850, admitted California as a free state. It divided what was left of the Mexican Cession, that territory the United States gained after the Mexican War, into two territories, New Mexico and Utah. It is important to understand that these were territories, not states. Regarding the slavery question in these territories, popular sovereignty would be used to decide. Let's make sure we understand that popular sovereignty is the idea that the people would decide. So people residing in these areas would vote to answer the question, slave or free. The compromise also set the border between Texas and the New Mexico Territory. It banned the slave trade in Washington, D.C. and established a much stronger Fugitive Slave Act. The new stricter Fugitive Slave Act that was part of the Compromise of 1850 dealt with runaway slaves, as slaves who ran away were considered fugitives from the law. The new law said that slaves were not allowed to testify on their, on their own behalf or have a trial by jury. It only took the word of a slave owner to claim an Afri African American was a slave, so free blacks could be placed into slavery and do nothing about it because they could not testify on their own behalf, and this did happen. The significance of the compromise is that it bought the United States a little more time before the Civil War. While Southerners liked the new Fugitive Slave Act, Northern abolitionists were outraged, increasing sectional tension. Popular sovereignty did not... Uh, please anyone and would eventually lead to violence. Our last compromise over the institution of slavery during this time period was the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas proposed a plan to settle the Nebraska Territory so that he could build a railroad to the West Coast. Being an Illinois Senator, he wants the railroad to go through Illinois. In order to do this, Douglas needed Southern support. In order to gain that support, he proposed that slavery would be settled through popular sovereignty in the Kansas and Nebraska Territories. 
What ensued was a fierce debate because this would al could potentially allow slavery north of the 3630 line. The act was signed by President Franklin Pierce in 1854 and divided the Nebraska Territory into the Kansas and Nebraska Territories. It repealed the Missouri Compromise by allowing for the slavery question in these territories to be decided through popular sovereignty. Northerners did not take this well, as both territories were north of the 3630 line from the Missouri Compromise, and pro-slavery forces in Kansas would soon be introduced to Mr. John Brown. The significance of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is that it avoided the Missouri Compromise and led to the creation of the Republican Party. It's important to understand that the Republican Party did not want to abolish slavery, it wanted to stop the spread of slavery into the territories. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the Republican Party when we get to the presidential election in 1860. And finally, there was violence between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces in Kansas, as both sides sent waves of people into the territory to influence the vote on slavery. Again, popular sovereignty. At the center of what came to be known as Bleeding Kansas was John Brown, who was an avid abolitionist crusader who believed he was doing God's work by punishing those who owned slaves. John Brown was tired of people talking about abolition. He wanted to force the issue. At what came to be known as the Potawatomi Massacre, John Brown and a band of abolitionists retaliated against those who had attacked abolitionist forces in, La in Lawrence, Kansas, by hunting, them, by hunting them down and hacking them to death with swords. All told, 200 people were killed in fighting between pro- and anti-slavery forces in Kansas, and the U.S. military would have to be called in. And this won't be the last time we talk about John Brown. There were many other issues in the 1850s that divided the country. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a novel that portrayed the horrors of slave life. Stowe was an active abolitionist, and her book was widely read, becoming the most read novel of the 19th century, and the, the only book that sold more copies in the 19th century, the Bible. The novel increased opposition to slavery and was concerning to Southerners as it put slavery in the spotlight. There was a story that says when Abraham Lincoln met Stowe in the early, sta early stages of the Civil War, he said, so this is the lady who started the Great War. While it is not clear whether Lee's words actually came out of the president's mouth, there is some truth to the sentiment, as Uncle Tom's cabin certainly increased the rising tension between North and South in the 1850s. Violence was not just limited to abolitionist crusaders with broadswords in Kansas during this time. There was also violence in the halls of Congress. After giving an anti-slavery speech, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts was approached by Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina. Brooks did not like the senator's message, especially the part where his uncle, Senator Andrew Butler, was insulted by Sumner. Brooks proceeded to beat Sumner within an inch of his life in Congress with a cane. While trying to escape from under a desk that was bolted to the floor, Sumner ripped it from the floor and ran down the hall. Butler proceeded to follow him, beating him over the head repeatedly until his cane broke. Sumner was viewed as a martyr. Brooks was seen as a hero. The people of South Carolina sent Brooks dozens of canes to replace the one he broke on Sumner's head with a message, good job. For those who think our politics are bad today, at least we don't have this. The Supreme Court also played a role in the increasing divide between North and South. Dred Scott was a slave who sued for his freedom after his owner took him into a free territory. The Chief Justice at the time was Roger Taney, who presided over a Supreme Court that was controlled by Southerners. In the decision, Taney said that as a slave, Scott was not a citizen, thus he had no right to be in court in the first place and had no claim to freedom. Taney continued by ruling that Congress had no right to prohibit slavery in a territory as slaves were property. This made the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. This was the first time the Supreme Court had used the power of judicial review since the Marbury v. Madison case in 1803. Southerners loved the ruling as slavery was now legal in all territories. Northerners were obviously outraged that the Supreme Court cleared the way for the expansion of slavery into the territories, and by 1857, the tension between North and South is reaching its boiling point. 
1858, Abraham Lincoln, a Republican lawyer from Illinois, challenged Stephen Douglas for, for Douglas' Senate seat. This is the same Stephen Douglas from the Kansas-Nebraska Act earlier. Lincoln challenged Senator Douglas to a series of debates centering around the issue of slavery. Douglas argued for popular sovereignty in spite of the Supreme Court's ruling in Dred Scott, and Lincoln, as a Republican, argued for no expansion of slavery into the territories. Lincoln believed slavery to be morally wrong, but did say, I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about, in any way, the social and political equality of the whites and blacks. Lincoln lost the race, but was now a, was now a name in the North. For those of you who are wondering what John Brown was up to since his adventures in Kansas, John Brown planned to start an armed slave rebellion in Virginia. This plan involved capturing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry and spreading out by distributing weapons to the hundreds of followers Brown thought would look to join his effort. Brown's plan failed when he was captured by Marines led by Robert E. Lee. Brown was tried and convicted of treason before being hanged. Brown's actions terrified Southerners as they always feared a slave revolt. And while Southerners viewed John Brown as a madman, he was a martyr for Northern abolitionists. Let's close the show by considering the election of 1860. The Democratic Party split between two candidates, Stephen Douglas, a Northern Democrat, and John C. Breckinridge, a Southern Democrat. Moderates nominated John Bell for the Constitutional Union Party, and Republicans nominated Abraham Lincoln. The Republican Party's platform in 1860 included no slavery in the territories, they called for a strong tariff, and they wanted internal improvements in the West. We can look at a quote from one of Lincoln's famous speeches, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. And it'll be the election of 1860 that will test Lincoln's idea. If we look at the map for the election of 1860, you can see that Lincoln wins the popular vote with about 40% of the, of the vote. He easily wins the Electoral College with 59%. But what's important when you look at this map is look at where Lincoln's support comes from. Look where that dark blue is. It's all in the north and it's all in the west. And the election of 1860 shows the sectional differences. As I just said, you know, Lincoln wins in the north and the west. Breckinridge, the Southern Democrat, wins in the South easily. And an interesting side note to this election, Lincoln's name doesn't even appear on the ballot in some Southern states. But here's why this is significant. People in the South sincerely believe that Lincoln, the Northern Republican, will end the institution of slavery as president, which is why on December 20th, 1860, about six weeks after Lincoln's elected, the state of South, South Carolina secedes from the Union, and it's going to start a chain reaction of events where other states will follow, and the, Un and the United States now finds itself embroiled in a civil war. And we'll start that war next class. Until then, good night, Albuquerque.